So before we talk about how to actually analyze regression discontinuity, um, we need to talk about the intuition behind this kind of approach to causal inference and why we care about this idea of arbitrary cutoffs and how that helps us with causal inference. Um, so to get to that, first, um, we need to revisit this idea of a quasi-experiment. Um, in the diff and diff session um, that we did in the last set of videos, um, we talked about this idea of a quasi-experiment, which is something where instead of you as a researcher assigning people to treatment groups and control groups, um, you let nature do it or other people do it or people maybe self-select into treatment and control groups. Um, and then you can analyze um, kind of the outcomes based on those groups that people sort themselves into or that nature does or that outside lotteries do. Um, and so we mentioned this in the, at the beginning of the diff and diff session, but it's also important we'll keep reviewing this um, because we spent a lot of this semester so far talking about DAGs and how you can use these causal graphs to isolate arrows between specific nodes. Um, and the whole goal of drawing a DAG is to be able to figure out the adjustment sets that you need to work with so that you can statistically isolate one arrow between your treatment and your outcome nodes. Um, we learned all sorts of fancy statsy ways to do that with regular observational data. Um, you can do matching, you can do inverse probability weighting, you can do a whole bunch of other cool stuff. Um, and those kinds of approaches don't need a diff and diff situation or a regression discontinuity situation. You can just do that with whatever observational data you have. The disadvantage to doing that is if you have a DAG um, with a, and then apply that to some sort of data set that you have, you have to make the assumption that every single column in there is something observable and everything in your DAG is completely observable um, and you've measured it and then you can find the causal effect. If you have unobservable things um, in your DAG and they don't exist in your data set, then you can't do the, the cool adjustment stuff or the inverse probability weighting stuff, um, which is why we turn to quasi-experiments. So with quasi-experiments, the idea is that we use context or situations or kind of the story behind some sort of um, situation that we see out in the world. And that helps us get around the idea of having unobserved confounders or unobserved variation. Because the context, like the story behind the situation that you see, is what assigns treatment and control. And that essentially isolates that pathway without needing to do inverse probability weighting or matching or other things. So with diff and diff, the situation that we saw there was that you have some sort of treatment group and a control group and a before and an after. Um, so with the example of New Jersey and Pennsylvania, um, New Jersey raised their minimum wage, Pennsylvania didn't, and so researchers could compare kind of the treatment group control group with the states and then before and after the, the policy change, and then they could measure the effect there. Um, that only works because it was a specific situation and they're relying on the context of that situation to identify that causal effect. Um, you can draw a DAG for a diff and diff, um, but you don't necessarily need to. It's helpful. Um, you can, because with diff and diff, if you throw um, a, an interaction term in a regression, you can also control for other things, and you did that in your problem set. Um, and you should use DAGs to influence and to um, show you what you should control for. You don't just want to throw random control variables in because it feels good. Um, you want those to be theoretically rooted in something. And so you still need DAGs. Um, but you're not isolating that relationship through adjustment. You're isolating that relationship through context. So regression discontinuity is a similar um, type of idea here. Um, where we're not relying solely on DAGs and the causal graph to isolate the causal relationship. Instead, we're relying on a situation. And here, the situation that we care about is this idea of having arbitrary rules that determine whether or not people can access programs. And we can leverage those rules and kind of the actual cutoff for eligibility um, to then create a treatment group and a control group. And that lets us talk about causal inference. So first, we need to talk about this idea of rules. There are tons of rules out in the world that determine whether or not you can access a program. Um, this is not a revolutionary new thing. Pretty much any social program has some sort of um, requirement or prerequisite that you have to meet. Um, and if you're above that threshold, 
um, then you can join the program. And if you're below, you can't, or vice versa. Um, so there are income thresholds, there are test-based thresholds, there are geographic thresholds, um, like the distance you live from a school determines if you can go to the school or not. Um, so there's a whole bunch of, of ways of determining eligibility for programs. Um, and that is kind of the main intuition behind all of this regression discontinuity stuff is that there is a rule and people follow that rule and we can rely on that rule to determine treatment and control groups. And so a couple of key vocabulary terms that we're going to be talking about throughout this session. Um, you have this idea of the running variable or sometimes it's called a forcing variable. Um, this is just the thing that determines eligibility. So if you have a means-based program um, like Medicaid or WIC or SNAP, there are specific running variables for that. Um, the income that you earn, the household size you have. Um, household, side, hel household size helps determine the income that you have to have or the income threshold you have to meet. Um, if you have test scores or GPA requirements for specific programs, those are, again, running variables. Um, then you have, along that running variable, you have something called a cutoff or a cut point or a threshold or something. Um, this is the number that formally assigns access to a program. So if you have some program that says you must score, you must have a 3.0 GPA to be able to use this program, um, that's your cut point. And so if somebody has a 3.1, they can use the program. If somebody has a 2.9, they can't. Um, and the running variable in that situation is GPA. Um, so again, we can draw DAGs for this stuff, and it's helpful to draw DAGs because then you know what else you need to maybe control for. Um, but this is what we see here for regression discontinuity. We have a running variable, GPA, income, something, um, and this has a cutoff. And being above that cutoff or below that cutoff, if it's something like WIC, you have to be below a certain income, that cutoff then gives you access to the program. And then the program then influences the outcome here. And so the running variable is um, your GPA is going to influence whatever outcome you have, and it's also going to influence access to the program. And so statistically, according to this, we need to adjust for the running variable or the cutoff here to be able to close that backdoor influence between running variable and, um, or between the outcome and program here. Um, and so rather than just controlling for these things, we're still going to statistically deal with these things, um, but we're gonna rely on this rule here to give us that, that statistical power to, or statistical, statistical ability to isolate this one arrow here that we care about. Um, so, there are tons of discontinuities out in the real world. Um, they are everywhere. Um, this right here is a good example um, for social services. This is the poverty line. I think it's from 2019. Um, the official poverty line depends on your household size. And so if you have here, if you have a household size of one, the poverty line counts as $12,760 a year or a thousand-ish dollars a month. Um, and then you can you can um, scale that up to different cut points here. So you can say 138% of the poverty line gives you access to different types of programs. So Medicaid, for instance, after the passage of the Affordable Care Act in lots of states, states that expanded Medicaid, um, you can get access to Medicaid if your income is less than 138% of the poverty line. So if you have 110% of the poverty line as your income and you're a household of five, um, then you qualify for Medicaid. If you're at 139%, then you don't qualify for Medicaid. And so you have this, this arbitrary rule that's determined by law that says that is the threshold you have to meet. Um, for getting access to the Affordable Care Act subsidies, that also has a threshold there. You don't get any Affordable Care Act subsidies if you have 137% of the poverty line for your income. But you do, once you hit 138, up to 400%. Um, this causes all sorts of weird problems in states that have not expanded Medicaid. Um, in those states, you do not qualify for Medicaid if you're at like 110% of the poverty line, um, but you also don't qualify for the Affordable Care Act subsidies um, because you're under 138%. And so in that situation, um, you have to like pay for full health insurance, which is not great um, and it's awful. And so there are nonprofits to help bridge that gap. Um, there are activists who are pushing to expand Medicaid in those states. Um, but there is this, this weird gap that's caused by this, um, this arbitrary cutoff here that we have. 
Um, getting access to CHIP or children's health insurance programs for most states is like 200% of the poverty line. Um, getting access to SNAP and free lunch for students is 130%. Getting reduced lunch is between 130 to 185%. So all of these are just arbitrary rules that legislators or legislators and bureaucrats have determined are the thresholds for accessing social programs. Um, there are a ton of other discontinuities out there. If we were in person, we would brainstorm together and put a big list up on the on the uh, whiteboard at the front. Um, but in your head, you can just imagine all sorts of rules for like you have to meet specific eligibility requirements to be able to do stuff. So that's what we're talking about here with discontinuities. Um, so as an example, um, throughout this session, what we're going to be using is this idea of this hypothetical program. Um, that provides tutoring to students, um, we'll say it's a high school, um, where students take an entrance exam at the beginning of a year. Um, those who score 70 um, out of 100 on this entrance exam get a free tutor, and they get to use that tutor for the whole year. Um, and then at the end of the year, students take an exit exam, and then we can compare, we can see what their outcomes are, what their final score is on that exit exam. So that's, that's the program we're talking about. It doesn't exist, um, but it does kind of follow this, has the same characteristics and follows the same patterns as tons of other social programs. You can imagine um, if you're trying to evaluate the, the effect of WIC on something um, or SNAP or anything that has a arbitrary cutoff, it's the same process here. So we're going to walk through what this looks like from a regression discontinuity standpoint, because we have a discontinuity. Those who score 70 or lower get a tutor. Those who score 71 don't. Um, and that is important um, because we want to be able to, to essentially find a treatment group and a control group. And we can do that because of this arbitrary cutoff. So if we plot um, these different outcomes, these are their in, these hypothetical students' entrance exams. Um, you notice all of these people down here, they scored pretty high, 80 to 100 is what we have right there. Um, and all of these people have no tutor um, because they didn't qualify for the free tutoring service. Um, these people here that scored below 70, they all used a tutor. And so you can see this yellow line here represents that arbitrary cutoff um, that determines access to the program. And so the people who scored above that cutoff are not using the program. And the people who scored below that cutoff are. Um, you could imagine it could be the opposite. If it was a program that was designed like an honors class or a gifted program or something, then if you score higher than that test, then you use the program. Um, doesn't matter which direction it goes. It's just you still have a cutoff that determines who gets to use the program. So the reason this is important for causal inference is this assumption right here, that the people right before and right after the threshold are essentially the same type of people. Um, if somebody scores 100% on the entrance exam, we can't really compare them to somebody who scores like a 40 on the entrance exam. They're going to be wildly different at some unobserved level, um, different testing abilities, different socioeconomic statuses, different life experiences, different ability of taking tests, a whole bunch of other things that make those types of people different. But if instead we compare people kind of in this gray zone where you say this person, like 70 is the cutoff, so maybe somebody scored a 68 and maybe this person scored a 71. Um, they're pretty very, very, very similar right there. The only difference between the 68 person or maybe the 69 person and the 71 person is maybe the, the 71 person um, had an extra egg for breakfast and so they were able to focus better. Um, and so they got a slightly higher score than somebody who didn't. Um, same testing ability, same everything else. It's just that one was just over the threshold and one was just under the threshold. Um, you can see this even better if you zoom in right here. So rather than looking at the whole range from 0 to 100, um, we can see here this goes from um, 64 to 76. And so what we're doing is looking just in th this narrow bandwidth. We can look at kind of this lighter gray here and compare these people who got 65 to these people who got 71. Or we can compare them even closer and say, here are the 69 people, the 70 people, compare them to the 71 people. And that essentially creates our treatment and our control groups. 
um, the people who use the program right here, that's our treatment group. People right here are the control group. They're essentially the same. It was just kind of random chance that one got in the program and one didn't. Um, and so that is the intuition behind this. We're able to essentially create a quasi experiment with a treatment and a control group that kind of acts like a randomized control trial. It's just that um, we're using the story of this arbitrary cutoff to determine who's in the treatment group and who's in the control group. Um, so again, the people right before and right after the threshold are essentially the same, which gives us treatment and control groups. So what we can do is act as if it was a randomized controlled trial. We can compare the outcomes for people who are right before and right after the, um, the cutoff and then calculate the difference in those outcomes. And then there is the causal effect of the program for people who are close to the cutoff. Um, so here's our same group of students here, but now instead of just on the y-axis showing if they used a tutor or not, we add another variable here. So here we're looking at their exit exam score. So we can see that people who did well on the entrance exam, people who scored in the 90s and 100s, they generally scored fairly high in the exit exam too. Um, there's a positive relationship here. If you draw a line, it kind of goes like this. So if you score low on the entrance exam, you're going to score low on the exit. If you score high on the entrance exam, you're going to score high on the exit exam, um, which makes sense. But by highlighting or by coloring these points by whether or not people used a tutor and adding the cutoff point, we can actually see that there's something going on here, that this group of people right here, right before the cutoff, that's a surprisingly high score, especially when you compare them to these people here who didn't get to use a tutor. But again, we're, we're assuming that these people are very, very similar. It's just kind of random chance that these guys got the tutor and these guys did not. So what you do to measure the causal effect is you essentially draw a best fit line here for the tutor group and the non-tutor group. And what that looks like is um, this. So you can see this blue line here, this is the general trend within the tutor group. And this red line, maroon line here, is the general trend for the no tutor group. And what happens right here is there's a jump or a discontinuity in that regression line that we have here. And that is because of the arbitrary rule. So we're saying people before the arbitrary rule, they have a specific trend and it ends up pretty high. And then after the rule, the average scores go back down and then start going back up. So the way you find the causal effect here is you look at this gap right here. The whole, all we're going to be doing this session is looking for gaps along a line. That distance right there is our causal effect. Um, so right here we have the difference between kind of the average outcome for people in the treatment group right at the threshold so like people who scored a seven or a 70.9 um, or a 69.9 because the threshold is 70 and then you compare these people who scored like a 71.1 and then basically compare those averages and that is your causal effect whatever distance that is is the effect of having a tutor um, so this looks like it's almost 10 points um, boosting your exit exam score by about 10 points having a tutor does that. Um, it only works for people along this line, like it's not boosting these people necessarily, um, but the people along the line, there's about a 10 point average difference. We can zoom in and see it a little bit better. Um, so this is zooming in, just looking at this, this closer range, uh, close to the bandwidth or close to the cutoff here, and you can see that causal effect again. Or these people have a higher score, they probably would have been lower, but because they have that tutor, because they qualified for it, because they are on this side of the cutoff, they have a higher average outcome. And then compare that to the other control group outcome and you have a difference there. So that is the intuition that we have here. Um, you have a rule, you have outcomes before and after the rule, and you can compare those outcomes and whatever difference you have is your causal effect. Um, lots of people do this. This, again, is a very popular method in economics and uh, political science and so, or social sciences in general, um, mostly because it's like super intuitive. You just say there's a rule, people on one side, you can compare them to the people on the other side and see if there's a difference. Treatment control group without a randomized controlled trial. Um, so I'm going to briefly show you some different examples of this in the real world.
Um, there's this cool paper here that finds a discontinuity that exists because of time zones, um, where you have geographic discontinuities. And so what these researchers did is they wanted to see if having more sunlight influences voting patterns and makes it so a voter turnout is higher or lower. Their assumption was that if it's lighter longer, people will vote more because it's there's more daylight outside. If it gets darker sooner, people are going to leave their lines and, and go home and not vote. And so to check this, they found a natural discontinuity, a natural arbitrary rule, um, time zone lines. So right here, this is the boundary between Eastern and Central time zone. Um, this is the boundary between um, Central and Mountain, and then they did the same thing for Mountain and Pacific. And they looked at voting precincts um, just on either side of the border. They have different numbers of miles, uh, plus or minus around the border. They do different um, variations of that throughout the paper to kind of measure the effect. Um, because they want to see if voter turnout is potentially higher in in areas that have, long, have more daylight, according to the time, like the actual clock time. And so what they find is that there's actually lower turnout in counties on the eastern side of a border. So if you imagine here, this is the east, if this is like the boundary between Georgia and Alabama, um, there's lower turnout in the Georgia side at the same time as the, the Alabama side. And in part, that's because of time zone differences. Um, you, it's a different time on the clock in central time than it is in eastern time. And so as a result, um, turnout changes. And so election schedules can actually ch cause variations in turnout. Um, and so the policy prescription here isn't like institute a new program to make clocks go longer on election day um, or abolish daylight savings or abolish time zones. There's not really like an actual policy you can do because of this. Um, but it is kind of this interesting phenomena that people vote less because it's dark and it's measurable um, without running a randomized control trial. Um, you can also do other types of discontinuities um, that have actual policy ramifications. This paper is fun um, because in California, um, insurance companies there required that after you delivered a baby, you got to have two nights in a hospital. Um, and so that's the arbitrary rule. And so what researchers did is they thought, does having additional time in a hospital improve um, health outcomes for a mother and for a baby? Um, because maybe they get extra medical care, they get more attention from nurses, they can catch any early uh, childhood diseases, they can catch any postpartum um, complications. And so what researchers wanted to know was, does extra time in the hospital improve health outcomes? Um, you can't ethically randomly assign people to spend an extra day in the hospital or not, um, because um, you can't. That's probably bad. But what they did instead is they relied on the context of the situation, because California's um, insurance requirement only kicks in at 12.01, so at midnight. So what they find here is that um, this is the running variable here, the minute that a uh, a woman gives birth here. Um, so what they find is that at like 11.59, um, you don't have an additional midnight generally because you only get to have two midnights in the hospital. So if you check into the hospital 11.50 and then give birth at 11.55, um, your first midnight happens five minutes later and you, you don't get kind of an extra night. If you happen to be checked in at the hospital at 12.01 and then deliver later, um, you get your first midnight like almost 24 hours later, and then you get another midnight after that. And so essentially coming in right here, like at 12 in the morning, up to one in the morning, that gives you like a free extra night in the hospital, um, according to this California rule, which means um, you essentially have treatment and control groups. The people who come at 11.50 and come at 12.10 are essentially the same type of people. It's just luck that made them go on either side of this cutoff here. So there's an actual discontinuity in the um, the running variable here at the minute of birth. Um, so um, there are more there. These people spend more time in the hospital than these people. Um, they're essentially the same people. It's just timing is weird. And so we can rely on that discontinuity to see if there's any differences in outcomes. 
So rather than plotting the number of midnights over on the y-axis, we can plot things like uh, the maternal mortality rate or the child mortality rate to see if maybe the people who are on this side of the continuity, um, discontinuity, who get kind of an extra free night in the hospital, maybe they have better health outcomes than the people on that side. Um, and what the researchers find is no. Um, so the 28-day the readmission rate, um, right around the 24-hour like midnight mark here, there's no discontinuity there. Um, so people who deliver at 11.55 and use up their first midnight five minutes later and don't get an extra day in the hospital, they have a, basically the same readmission rate um, as people who get an extra midnight in the hospital. Um, and then mortality rate for mother and child. Also, there's no discontinuity right here at midnight. Um, and so what they find is having kind of that extra free night in the hospital has no effect on these health outcomes. Um, and so their prescript or their policy recommendation was we don't necessarily need to force people to stay an extra midnight. It's not necessarily helping with health outcomes um, on average. And so that was kind of their main finding, which they could do without a randomized controlled trial. They didn't have to create treatment and control groups because that's unethical. They just relied on the fact that a rule was essentially creating treatment and control groups for them. Um, one more example here. Um, researchers were wondering if there is a benefit to going to um, kind of your flagship state university versus a smaller state university. Um, so in the case of Georgia here, this is like if you go to UGA, versus um, Georgia Southern or some other smaller um, University of Georgia or University System of Georgia um, University. And so what they wanted to, to see is if you go to something like UGA or UNC or one of the, the big main public university for the state, does that make you earn more money later on? And to do this, you again can't use a randomized control trial for this. That's unethical. Um, but there are cutoffs. Um, you have to meet a certain SAT score to be able to apply to UGA and to be able to get into UGA. Um, and so they relied on these cutoffs to determine um, basically who the treatment group and who the control group are. Um, so if we look at their outcomes here, this is their running variable. So this is the SAT score. They have some admission cutoff for um, the flagship universities in the, in the states they were looking at. And so if you have SAT score above the 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 cutoff here, you're more likely to be enrolled in the university. So up here, this is like a 50 to 60 to 70 percent chance of enrolling. Um, if you're below the cutoff, you only have like a 5 to 10 percent chance of enrolling. So there is a clear cutoff in the running variable, which we want, um, because that means that people are following this rule. That rule is helping assign people to the program or not the program. Um, and the main intuition, again, is that the people who scored five points above and five points below are basically the same person. Um, it was just random chance that they happen to be on either side of the, the discontinuity. If you're comparing these people with these people, you can't, that's not a comparable treatment and control group. Um, but these people right around this cutoff, that is. So now that we know there's a cutoff, what they did then is they looked at outcomes around that cutoff. So the y-axis here is no longer enrollment rate to see if people are going to the school. It is um, the log of earnings um, X number of years after graduation. And what they find is that people um, who were above the SAT threshold here had higher earnings on average than people who did not, um, which makes sense for to some extent. Like the people who got super high SAT scores, they're going to have higher earnings than the people who got super low, um, just given the jobs that they'll likely apply to and be accepted at. Um, but if you're looking just at this gap right here, that gap right there is the um, flagship university difference. Um, so because somebody went to UGA versus Kennesaw State or Georgia Southern or something, um, or UNC in North Carolina versus like Appalachian State um, or Eastern Carolina University, um, that causes a big difference, or not huge, I think it's a 9% difference there in, in wages. Um, because of going to the flagship university. And so you can measure that and measure the causal effect of this program or of university um, without having a treatment and control group, which works pretty well. Um, so these, these regression discontinuity designs are great. People love these things. Um, 
economists and social scientists spend all day just kind of looking out the window and checking to see if there are rules. And once they discover a new rule, um, they try to find some discontinuity around the rule and then they try to use it for regression discontinuity purposes because um, they're cool. And they're also fun because they're intuitive, they're compelling, they're really graphical. Um, as you'll see when we do the R stuff, lots of the intuition behind the discontinuity is like based on plots. So you have lots and lots of plots to show the running variable, to show a jump in the running variable, to show the outcome, to see if there's a jump in the outcome. Um, you can narrow the bandwidth down around the, the cutoff. You can do all sorts of cool graphical things to measure that gap, and you can very easily see that gap. Um, and it's super intuitive. People love these things. Um, there's also this cool new research here um, from this paper that came out a year ago. It hasn't been published yet um, as of 2020. Um, but what they find here is um, these researchers um, looked at a whole bunch of quasi-experimental research designs um, with difference and differences, um, regression discontinuity, randomized controlled trials, and instrumental variables. And what they found is by looking at hundreds of different studies, um, that regression discontinuity designs were less susceptible to p-hacking um, and to the file drawer problem where people uh, run a study and they find there's no significant effect and then they don't publish it. Um, or people are throwing in random control variables to get a statistically significant effect and then publish that. Um, with regression discontinuity, there's less of that. Um, because in part there are fewer kind of statistical shenanigans that you can do um, to make a causal effect. And if you do statistical shenanigans, they're pretty obvious graphically. Um, and we'll see that in just a minute in the next section. Um, and then the, the main concerns with regression discontinuity section. Um, there are specific rules that you have to follow to make sure that you're not kind of overstating um, the causal effect that you find. And so um, in general, people tend to find these more credible um, often than instrumental variables or diff and diff. Um, they're not perfect. Um, you still have to make assumptions that people right before and right after are the same. Um, you have to make sure people are actually following the rules. Um, you might, you will often find things called fuzzy regression discontinuity, where if you have this cutoff of 70, technically nobody above 70 should use a tutor, but you might find people with a score of 75 using a tutor. And then that messes up your whole inference because those are the control group people, but they're doing the treatment. And so you have spillover effects and it's a mess. Um, and there are ways to take care of that. Um, but again, it's not a perfect method, but it's, it's cool, it's intuitive, um, and it, it's exciting and fun. So um, let's talk about how to actually do it.